participants, dear guests. I'll continue for a short time in Macedonian, and I will introduce after on, on uh, the other uh, panelists on the second uh, discussion of the day. Izgubene telefon, koji što go ima broj od 071-203-766. Može da go nadete vo tehnika. Ok. You were lucky. <laughs> uh, the last pan panel for this uh, first Western Balkan Digital Summit, Skopje 2008, uh, is on the topic the digital economy and society, titled Digital Transformation opportun Opportunities. This panel will address the opportunities which the data economy can provide in the region. Platform-based networks, G clouds, Internet of Things for citizens are drivers of this transformation. Interoperability and security data exchange are the key conditions, best practices and the pilot projects will be addressed on this panel. The moderator of this panel will be Mr. Vasko Kronevski and the panelists are Mr. David Ringrose, Mr. Dusan Radošević, Mr. Damjan Manchevski, Ms. Larisa Halilović, Mr. Mihail Jovanović, Ms. Marlinda Karčanaj and Mr. Mislav Galar. I wish you a nice discussion and enjoy the time. Thank you. First of all, welcome everyone. Thank you for attending this session. I'm very pleased to host this panel and to moderate such a distinguished set of speakers and guests. I was pleased to accept the invitation to moderate this panel, especially when I see the list of guests and the list of panelists. I must say that uh, it's really good to work, to cooperate, to communicate with the people being on this panel. Most of them we know from business, traveling across the region, cooperating, discussing potential opportunities to do the digital transformation. Uh, I'm amazed about what is happening these two days. Uh, we have never before in the region seen such a high political level support to push the digital transformation in the region. And this was discussing the last couple of months that this summit will happen, that this political support and strength and push coming from the highest political leaders will come. But until this happened, I was really a little bit skeptic around this. But when I saw the prime ministers yesterday discussing about digital transformation, then ministers on panels and in the hallways being really energized about what we can do to help the region connect and become a digital single market, I must say this is the best event in the many years before that happened. And looking forward for the next summits, as I understood that's going to be next summit next year in our uh, neighboring country, Serbia, and uh, I really welcome uh, this summit. And I'm looking forward to see what we're going to do in this next year uh, together. We're going to talk today about the digital economy and society and how the digital transformation using the new tools, the new technology can help traditional industries, public sector, uh, enterprises transform the way to do business to become, to become more competitive. Furthermore, we need to accelerate this because as we see globally, all of the global economies, the leaders in the global economy are doing this in fast pace. We see that the European Union is pushing this on the highest level of their agenda, connecting the digital uh, single market of Europe and making it more competitive for the companies working in EU markets. But also we see this in US, we see all across the world, Asian tigers and all over, they're all relying on digital transformation to be, become more competitive. But what we do, what we do nationally and regionally to become more competitive? Because we do, if we don't do, we are losing the race. Now, if you ask me where we stand today comparing to the global leaders, it's like comparing the Olympics team of US and Germany to the Olympics team of the regional countries. I will talk specifically about the smaller countries. So the way we succeed potentially on the Olympics, if we have talented players, but not if we grew talent, but if this talent somehow emerges by itself. It's very similar in technology. We have good examples from the region where technology companies are emerging and accessing global markets, but this is a very rare example. Why? Because the environment, the regulation, the support from the public sector, the supporting industries that can help these companies succeed on the global market are not there yet. 
And this is happening in the European Union. They are building this environment and society where companies can succeed easier. Where do we stand? How we can push this? How we can uh, co cooperate together within the country, all the stakeholders, across the region, all the stakeholders, to improve this pace of transformation so we can catch up, not to lag behind with the same gap as today, but to catch up. And if we say in five years, how we can make sure that in five years we are equally competitive with the global players coming out of the global economies. So this is the topic of today's discussion. We're going to focus in different areas of uh, discussion. All of the panelists will give, first of all, their current perspective, what's happening in their environment, what they do, uh, what are the initiatives that they work on related to the digital single market and digital transformation of the economy and the society. I would invite Mr. David Ringros. He is the head of the International Outreach of DigiConnect, but he is also very, uh, I would say, knowledgeable about the topic because he was one of the initiators of the Digital Single Market Initiative and the uh, public speaker around it for many years. So, David, please welcome and give us your perspective of what's happening in European Union and the initiatives of European Commission. Thanks very much, Vasco. I think um, you're right uh, that this has been an enormous success and we've seen a lot in the, in the past couple of days, a lot of ideas and, and uh, um, the important point is yesterday when we see ministers and prime ministers who all understand what's going on and this is what we've been doing a lot in Brussels as well. Our effort has been not just to keep this as a sectoral issue or an issue among technocrats or with the businesses, but the prime ministers themselves need to engage and they need to say this really matters. And last year in December in Tallinn, uh, we had all of the prime ministers together um, and they all agreed that uh, we have to finish the digital single market by the end of this year. So this is a very important year, not just for the Western Balkans, but for the, for the EU, because all of the work that we've done, the digital single market package that we released, the Commission has done its job, we've released all of these, these, these proposals, uh, but then now, of course, we have to get everything through the legislators, through the Parliament and through the, uh, through the Council, and uh, when the Prime Ministers say that they have a target, then this means hopefully we'll actually achieve what we, what we set out to achieve. Um, since then, of course, we've delivered what we call the triple win for consumers, which is uh, the end of roaming uh, charges within the EU, um, the end of unjustified geo-blocking, so you don't get geo-blocked because you're in a different country in the European Union, and uh, what you could call roaming for your content, the content portability, so that you can uh, take your content with you from one member state to another, uh, and you don't have different services and so on. So this is a very clear indication that what we're trying to do is to give the customers what they want, and then they will demand more, and then we'll get more services. Huh? Since then, we've launched a, a bunch of other initiatives, such as a proposal on the free flow of non-personal data. Uh, and here, obviously, what we're trying to do is to build a single market in Europe for data without uh, unjustified uh, data localization, where, uh, which adds to the costs, which adds to the burden, and which is not going to allow companies to scale up and so on. A package of measures to boost cybersecurity, because obviously without trust, uh, we won't have the market that we want. And a communication on illegal content online, because uh, people are more and more concerned, I think, about, about the world that sometimes they see. And next week, we have a big deadline uh, as well. We're releasing a couple of packages of more uh, proposals, one which is uh, extremely important on artificial intelligence. Um, and I think anybody who's read the news in the past month or so realizes how important this is. Uh, this is not a niche issue. This is something that is in all of our lives. And what we're trying to do is to ensure that artificial intelligence can be a force that is accepted for people, a force that can improve competitivity and efficiency and isn't just something that's out of control, uh, that people uh, uh, accept it, that we have uh, a European framework of ethics and values around it and so on. Uh, we'll also have a, a communication about uh, fake news, which I think will be discussed later today, uh, and about data, about data on online platforms, platforms to business, uh, and on uh, the use and reuse of public data. So there's a lot of things going on, uh, and um, uh, the, machine, the machine doesn't stop. Um, there's one other issue which I think is important, is about uh, e-government and EID. Uh, and there last year, I think, uh, there was another declaration in Tallinn on uh, European e-government, uh, talking about the importance of interoperability of EID solutions. Um, 
and I think uh, an important date for the Western Balkans will be in, in the autumn this year under the Austrian presidency where we think it will be very useful for the, the economies of the region to sign up themselves to this Tallinn Declaration. Um, and this is largely what we're trying to do. If you say, what are we doing in the EU and what are we doing to try to bring the economies of the region in, this is one example. We agree that this is important. We agree that among the member states of the EU, this has to be a target and we want to bring the economies of the Western Balkans in as well. And this is more or less what we're trying to do in the uh, flagship initiative on the digital agenda is to look at everything that we're doing and seeing where can we accelerate, where can we bring the countries of the region in. We had Barak this morning and uh, uh, Mr. Gungel is uh, involved in the process, but not all economies of the region are members of Barak, yes. So we say, well, we have to get people into, into the discussion, because unless people are actually in the discussion, then they're not capable of being part of the discussion. And as we saw, we've seen over the past couple of days, I think there's a lot of really useful things that we can learn that we can bring to the discussion. So we're looking at all of our organizations, like the regulators, like the regulators' audiovisual sector and so on, and seeing how we can bring uh, uh, the economies of the region into this discussion. Because we don't want to move ahead on one process in the EU, and then a different process in the Western Balkans. We want these things to be synchronized as soon as possible. Um, uh, and this is a lot of what we'll be talking about in the, uh, in the digital agenda um, that we hope to launch in uh, the European Council in, in, in May. So, um, and what, last week, I think one very interesting example, we had what we call our digital day, which is where we get um, uh, all the member states to come and to sign up to initiatives that we, that we had. Last year, we had a big initiative on high-performance computing, where we're trying to get all the member states to sign up to the objectives of that. Uh, and we see that there's some member states in, in, in the Western Balkans as well who want to, want to join. And uh, we were very happy last, uh, last week that the, uh, Serbia uh, signed up to joining uh, 5G corridor, because if we're going to have success on our connected cars initiatives, we don't want cars stopping at borders. And so we're looking at corridors and so on. And this is not just corridors between uh, uh, Germany, Austria, and Italy, for example. We also need to look at the Western Balkans. So there, I think that's a very good example of where we can uh, uh, bring the uh, economies of the region into the process from the beginning, uh, and everybody wins. Huh? So that's what we're trying to do. That's very good news to hear. A lot of initiatives, a lot of connecting initiatives with the region, which is for us good to hear. And hopefully there is going to be an accelerated pace to connect the region. Later on, we're going to discuss a little bit about what's going to happen in the future and what's planned. But now we need to go forward and see some what's the current state of development, what's happening in Albania in the area of uh, digital transformation. Uh, Ms. Merlinda Karzanay, the General Director of Agency for Information Technology of Albania, would give us this uh, introduction. I must say that throughout the last years we have been receiving very good news from Albania. Huge pace of transformation, a lot of digitalization in the public sector, and of course this is uh, heard throughout the region. You have been doing a lot of big infrastructure projects, but also good uh, digital service transformation in the public sector. Can you please tell us a little bit more about that? Thank you. Uh, E-governance is today a tangible reality in Albania, I can say, and is managed and coordinated by the National Agency for Information Society. Uh, beginning from last September, uh, the responsibilities of our organization uh, are extended. Now we have the uh, duty to uh, implement and manage all the new ICT projects to manage the uh, centralized infrastructure in ICT in Albania, and also uh, we are the providers of the uh, digital seal as well as electronic signature for public employees and now also for the businesses. I wanted to give you a real life success story of Albania, uh, where e-governance is not just a project to be implemented, but is now a reality and is being used from the citizen businesses and in the last uh, six months also from public employees which are offering services on behalf of the citizen. Uh, Albania <laughs> is having 1,325 uh, 1, services of level 1 to 4 based in UN PAN classification 
and is currently offering 551 electronic services, out of which 120 bear legal value due to the digital seal and electronic signatures. Uh, currently, we added in the portal last week, I think, uh, 14 new e-services that include payment of taxes and tariffs, and they are being promoted from our Ministry of Economy and Finances. Also, we are offering um, currently services for the municipalities. Uh, we had a very successful pilot with municipality of Tirana, and we're looking forward to uh, implement their e-payments for the other municipalities. But what's the secret of Albania? Uh, the portal is connected to the governmental interoperability platform is a core architecture platform which connects currently 48 electronic registers. Those registers exchange the data in real time, making it able for all the uh, applications to be filled more than 50% directly in the moment of application from the data that are being exchanged through the registers. Uh, for the past two years, there have been 25 million transactions in the governmental interoperability platform. Our platform is implemented based in Microsoft technology. We have the governmental agreement and I thank uh, Microsoft for their support. It's the same technology that is being used in UK, uh, Czech Republic, Georgia and Cyprus as well. Uh, according to Microsoft, our country's um, uh, best case in interoperability and data exchange between the systems. And based on this experience, I can suggest the regional interoperability as an initiative that Albania could lead if the region will, will agree. Uh, in order to use the interoperability platforms that are being implemented in other region, of course, this step is a big one and requires agree agreement between states and as well as a legal framework in order to make sure that we exchange the data in the region uh, and we have cross-border interoperability. Uh, currently, uh, 30 services in Albania are with digital seal, which means that the citizen or business can just log in in the portal based in EID or username and password and get right away the document sealed. He can uh, use this document, forward it and uh, make sure that he spend only two or three minutes in the portal. Uh, the last initiative of the new government, and I can say that uh, the Prime Minister Edurama is really a very uh, promoter of this one, is the only electronic usage of certificates, personal and uh, family certificates. In the very first meeting of Council of Ministers of the new government is uh, approved the technical detail of the digital seal and this process made possible uh, of generating one million digitally sealed documents in the last six months. And the hard copy certificates I think are uh, four times less compared to before, uh, a very good uh, saving for the citizens. We have evaluated that uh, we saved over 250,000 hours spent in this portal, which is like 30 years of time, and as well as money. Uh, we calculated like 200,000 euros that we saved from the citizen uh, using our, uh, our uh, new improvement in the portal. Also, a very important initiative is the uh, usage of portal for public employees on behalf of the citizen. So we decided for all the documents that we have for, with the digital seal, not to be asked anymore uh, at this portal from the public employees. So they, if they need those documents in the file, they should provide those documents themselves. In the beginning it was very hard because uh, public employees were like a little afraid to spend time and to um, 
make sure that they provide the associated documents. But uh, since the Prime Minister promoted it and it was very, very uh, much announced in the media, the citizens themselves, they requested it. They were like, okay, you heard the Prime Minister, no more certificates, so provide the certificate for me. And now all the institutions are running to create their profile in Albania and be able to, uh, to help the citizen. Also NICE is a qualified provider, as I mentioned, of electronic signatures. Uh, we issue e-signatures to doctors, engineers, architects, custom agents, and um, now this, um, uh, this is extended to all the businesses. Currently, we're working at the e-residence project, which will make possible for foreign investors and businesses to remotely initiate a business in Albania. Also, we are working on e-visa project, which um, apparently from the application submission, which is online currently in Albania, will make able for foreigners to receive their Albanian visa electronically with digital seal and legal value. Uh, in the very end, I wanted to uh, mention again what the Deputy Prime Minister said yesterday. We'll would be very help, uh, happy to welcome the summit on 2020 in Albania. So, thank you. It's also very good to hear ambition to support the regional agenda for digital transformation. Of course, it's very good to hear that you have already implemented a couple of very key principles for digital transformation. The digital by default, because issuing documents being original in digital form is the core of the it's the essence of the meaning digital by default. And what you just said that you're issuing certificates that are only in digital form. It's very important to hear. Also, once only principle, meaning that the digital the, the administration would not require documents and information that the administration owns within the administration as a whole. It's also very important to hear that in practice is implemented. Good examples that many countries from the region can learn from and see and maybe exchange knowledge in different areas where other countries succeed also being implemented in Albania, vice versa. And it's good to have these regional conversations to see how we can, in accelerated pace, uh, see the success across the region. Recently, we have also uh, heard a lot of, uh, I would say, movement in Serbia. We have seen a lot of big, cha big changes happening in the last uh, one year, especially. Uh, we are following the region, we are traveling across the region, and we see that in Serbia, in a very accelerated pace, have adopted big changes in the legislation to adopt these key principles that we are discussing today. Also interoperability, digital by default, once only, and implementing the uh, adoption of the local legislation uh, to support all those principles. We have today here uh, our guest, Mihailo Ivanovic. He is the general director of the Office for IT and uh, e-government in Serbia. And I'm glad to introduce uh, Mihailo. He is knowledgeable about the subject. He is with his hands deep into the initiatives that we are talking today, and he can share his view of what's happening in Serbia around this. Welcome. Pre početka svog izlaganja, želim da se zahvalim na fantastičnoj prilici da učestvujem na ovom skupu, da čestitam vladi Republike Makedonije, Ministarstvu spojnih poslova i Ministarstvu za informacijalno društvo i administraciju i mom kolegi Damjanu na fantastičnoj organizaciji. Stvarno je veliko zadovoljstvo i prilika da danas učestvujem na ovom panelu. I slušao sam pažljivo kada si pričao o tom uzbuđenju koje je postojalo kada si slušao premijere različitih država koji govore o digitalizaciji. Ono što se desilo u Srbiji negde u junu prošle godine je da smo dobili novu vladu gde je jedan od prioriteta vlade postavljena digitalizacija. Nova premijerka Ana Brnabić je digitalizaciju postavila kao jedan od prioriteta i 
posebnu pažnju je u svom ekspozeu posvetila samom procesu digitalizacije. Mnogo stvari smo za nekoliko meseci uspeli da uradimo i ja bih ovde istakao brzo donošenje dva bitna zakona koje su nam u značajnoj meri doprineli u stvaranju zakonske regulative koji će omogućiti digitalnu transformaciju u Republici Srbiji. Prvi zakon je zakon o elektronskom poslovanju koji za razliku od ranijih zakona koji je definisao samo elektronski dokument prvi put definiše i razmenu elektronskih dokumentata, to je trusted delivery usluge i podrazumeva čuvanje dokumentata u elektronskoj formi, znači elektronsko arhiviranje i nešto što smo imali puno problema u implementaciji usloga elektronske uprave, prvi put mogućnost korišćenja elektronskog potpisa u klaudu. Znam kakve su slučajevi bili u drugim, u okruženju Zapadnog Balkana. Kod nas je do sada postajalo mogućnost korišćenja samo kvalifikovanog elektronskog sertifikata na smart kartici od nekoliko različitih provajdera ovih usluga i postojale su ogromne muke sa različitim middleverima i verujemo da je sam kvalifikovan elektronski sertifikat bio u principu objektivna prepreka da se usluge elektronske uprave još više koriste. Elem, od oktobra meseca imamo novi zakon o elektronskom poslovanju. On podrazumeva čak 17 različitih podzakonskih akata. Prvi set od devet podzakonskih akata će biti donet naredne nedelje i oni će definisati različitu šemu elektronske identifikacije, mogućnost korišćenja elektronskog potpisa u klaudu, elektronsku identifikaciju, dakle na neki način savremenu infrastrukturu elektronskog poslovanja u Republici Srbiji. Drugi značajan zakon koji je prošle nedelje usvojen u Skupštini je zakon o elektronskoj upravi. To je naime prvi put da se ovaj zakon donosi u Srbiji I on definiše dve neverovatno bitne stvari. Jedno je, definiše ono što radi Kancelarija za informacijne tehnologije i elektronsku upravu koja je osnovana u augustu prošlog meseca, a drugo je, uvodi obavezu elektronskog upravnog postupanja državnih organa. Ovaj zakon, dakle, definiše šta je to državni data centar, šta je državni disaster recovery centar, šta je servisna magistrala organa po kojoj se razmenjuju podaci, definiše i portal otvorenih podataka, definiše i drugi državne portale kao mesto elektronskog upravnog postupanja i nameće, naravno, obavezu svih državnih organa da moraju da obezbede elektronsko upravno postupanje. U skladu s ovim drugim zakonom, zakonom o e-upravi, Treba sad da donesemo novih 12 podzakonskih akata na kojima smo već intenzivno krenuli da radimo, ali mislim da je tu ključno da definišemo katalog usluga, da definišemo katalog upravnih postupaka, katalog web servisa, da definišemo metaregistar, da napravimo integraciju ovih akata registara i metaregistara i da ono što sad imamo, a to je portal elektronske uprave i servisnu magistralu organa, napravimo integralan informacijoni sistem koji će omogućiti automatizaciju uvođenja novih elektronskih usluga elektronske uprave. Imamo naravno ambicizne planove i da po jednom i po drugom zakonu svi podzakonski akti budu doneti u narednih dva, tri meseca i da se bacimo na njihovu implementaciju. U narednom krugu možemo da pričamo i o našim praktičnim rezultatima, ali mislim da je ovo veoma značajno da smo na nivou zakona postavili sve ono što nam treba da krenemo s implementacijom i digitalizacijom elektronske uprave, savremene, moderne elektronske uprave u Republici Srbije. Hvala vam, Helo.
Thank you. Um, as you can also see, there is a huge movement, <laughs> and it's, uh, it's tremendous to see the energy within the team that Mihailo has in pushing this agenda on a fast pace. Uh, there is a huge movement towards a lot of projects in, in Serbia to implement this, but also uh, a lot of structural reforms in terms of legislation and public administration readiness to implement this change. And looking forward to the next summit, you being the host and promoting the successes of the next year. Well, uh, we are in Belgrade next year. Uh, being local from Skopje, uh, my company is out of Skopje, but we do work in the region and outside. We do travel a lot, we see different examples, but we also are quite involved in the projects locally in Macedonia. We have seen a lot of successes in implementation of different key enablers, different key principles in the last couple of years. I must say that uh, the country maybe was lagging behind in terms of legislation change. Uh, there was maybe a justification for that. There was a political turmoil in the last couple of years in the country. The focus of the parliament was not towards the digital transformation, was not heading and supporting the industry with the legislative change. But I must say the project implementation in the industry was not lagging behind. The industry was pushing the digital agenda, creating solutions and products, and pushing even the public administration forward, although there was no basis for uh, in, the in the legislation. Uh, here we have the Minister of, Inform of Information Society and Public Administration, Mr. Damian Manchevsky, who is deeply involved and he's basically leading the digital transformation within the country, and he has a lot to share with us about what has happened in the last uh, one year and of course what's going to happen in the near future, what are the current agenda and what are the current initiatives that the government is doing to push this forward. Of course, I congratulate you and the ministers and the governments of the region for pushing this summit and the digital agenda for connecting the region and we welcome you to go forward into this and we'll provide all the support from the industry to support these initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kronowski. We both share the ordeals we're going through <laughs> into the pushing the digital agenda in Macedonia. As you have said, um, yes, I'm the minister in charge of uh, pushing the digital agenda forward, but now it's, it's easy. We have support. <laughs> we have support from the governments, we have support regionally from all governments, and we have support from the European Union as well. The political awareness regarding the digital agenda, digital society, digital economy has become significantly, significantly higher than, than ever before. And I'm again thankful that uh, one of the six flagships of the EU newest EU strategy for, for Western Balkans, one of the six flagships is also the digital agenda as well. Um, my ministry was created in 2008 only as a Ministry of Information Society. And then several years after, somebody added administration to its title. Then I was, didn't even think that I'm going to become a minister, but I asked myself, why on earth would anyone do that? <laughs> to mix something beautiful such as Information Society with the administration. But now, that, not now, but several years back, um, it make, made the perfect sense because really, I believe that the digitization is the core of the reform of any public administration anywhere. And it's very much interlinked. As the digitization is transforming our societies, our lives, it must also transform the administration as well. Um, I'm looking forward, I hope, I think that after this summit, even the public awareness in Macedonia is going to change in swift towards, toward the digital agenda and the information society as the core of the transformation of the public administration. Because all the questions so far that I received in the media about my sector was about the number of employees and how they're gonna be restructured and how many are gonna be laid off and how many we will employ, which are very relevant questions. But the end of the day is how are we going to provide better services to the citizens? And nowadays, the best service is on your device and electronically. Uh, Vasco, you mentioned you were um, uh, inspired by the speeches yesterday by the prim prime ministers. I have to say, the, the moment I took over office, I was inspired from what I saw in the region, in Albania and in Serbia, for instance. 
uh, one of the first things I did, I went to see the digital agency in Albania. And then we, I met Mr. Ivanovic in Slovenia for the business forum, and we discussed in length. So I can now sincerely say that we had a strategic approach that we let them make the first initial mistakes, and now we can use only the best practice. <laughs> but I'm only joking. Of course, we are cooperating and regionally in taking their best practice and now trying to implement it here. We as a country had um, the policies of investing heavily into hardware, hardware into, into, into institutions. Even now, I find hardware all over without the, the institutions having the capacity to inhibit the equipment, to inhibit the processes. And now, because what Mr. Gronowski also said is very correct, we did not have the legal environment, the legal framework for this. And we're about to create it. Tomorrow, I'm, I'm happy to announce that we're going to have the first public debate on the law for electronic register of population that we're going to uh, implement during this year, following the new national portal for e-services, following the legislatory framework for creating EID of our citizens. So these processes are already ongoing and going parallel. Yes, they should have been finished before, but it is good that we are doing them maybe now and in coordination with all the other institutions and with all the other processes. The public will be, of course, invited and they, it will be involved in the entire processes and procedures. Um, the, what's, what's the point of it? It's not only to make the reorganization, I, I hate the word reform of administration, reorganization of the administration inside, but to provide better services to the citizens. And as I said yesterday, it is much easier today to take the services to the citizens rather than to take the citizens to the services, to the institutions. And we can do it electronically. There are several good, extremely good initiatives that we can engage into jointly and regionally. And now we even have the announcements of the European Commission and other international donors and international banks that I've met here, they're willing to support. I quoted an African uh, proverb yesterday, I'm going to quote an American one today, which says, now we have to put our money where our mouth is. So enough about strategies, plans, legislation, we will finish this. And then we have to agree to invest into broadband infrastructure. We need to invest <coughs> into providing services into the wide zones. We need to invest into connectivity between the countries, digital connectivity. There are other ministers to discuss about roads. We need to raise uh, the awareness also among the potential donors as well, but we also have to commit from our national budgets. Um, much of the attention from this summit uh, in the media was aimed at the roaming initiative, which is fine, perfect. I will benefit from it as well when I travel. But much more uh, important initiative for the businesses, for the citizens, is our mutual willingness to jointly apply for finances for um, uh, digital connectivity, for broadband, but also the initiative to mutually recognize our digital seals and signatures. This is an enormous, enormous opportunity for all citizens and all businesses. It requires a lot of investment in infrastructure. It requires a lot of investment in human capacities as well. But if we have the political support for this initiative, then it can become realistic. And then we can really say that our citizens in Western Balkan countries have integrated in Europe much sooner digitally than, than politically. We don't intend to, to fall behind politically as well. I'm not saying it won't. But uh, we can do this much, much, much faster. And the citizens will see the difference, will see the benefits, will see how things can change through the way of, of digital transformation. So um, to, make, to make the long story short, we're engaging in parallel in many different initiatives in Macedonia and finally making them real. Is the national, uh, new national portal for e-services, is the population uh, registry, is the new national portal for open data that will be also launched in the next several months. The transparency is key 
policy of this government and can provide a lot of business opportunities for anyone who, who wants to engage, such as we've heard about one of the examples last night about that young kid that created uh, an app that we all use now about pollution, unfortunately, in Macedonia, based on open data, uh, based on open data information that he had. So there can be a lot of opportunities even for businesses, just with a little bit of innovation for them to develop totally new business initiatives from getting just the information from, from the administration. Uh, we are going into this process. There is no going back. We have the support. It is actually now up to us how we're going to get organized, how we're going to learn from each other's experiences, good and bad, and how we're going to financially also commit to everything that, that we are saying that we're going to do in the following period. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to hear something that is a music for the ears of the industry, that governments will commit funding to the digital transformation. I hope that a lot of companies in the audience would like to hear that commitment across the region because this is what the industry would like to hear in order to position, prepare and support the process. Of course, private entities like to drive, be driven by the commercial opportunities lying ahead. Uh, it's also good to hear that uh, it's going to be an accelerated pace in the digital transformations within the public administration. Because what I see as a, uh, as a common problem across the region is that the digital transformation happening, it's addressing or it's impacting only a small part of the society, not the whole society. We are, create, we are getting the pace faster to get and connect it to the digital single market in Europe, but we are building a big digital divide because some parts of the society are lagging behind. I've read some analysis from the European Commission that said that 75% of the potential growth in the economy with the digital single market lies within the traditional industries, not within the IT as such, but IT being the enabler of the digital transformation of the traditional industries. We need to also focus on how to develop the skills, how to empower other traditional industries, but also the public sector. Because if having an efficient public sector would definitely benefit having an efficient and dynamic companies. We, all, we always say one of the key competitiveness of the region is that we have a skillful labor force, a skillful labor force in IT, and it's cheaper than the global economy's IT. But at the end, whether our total efficiency being supported by the public services at the scale we have, combined with the cheaper labor force, do, are we competitive globally or we are losing our, let's say, price competitiveness with the low efficiency of the service being delivered by the society. So all those issues need to be tackled and invested. One of the good initiatives that I've heard before the summit, and we have a speaker to talk about this, it's the initiatives around digital cities across the region. And this is a really regional project, one of those that we would like to see more across the region. So Ms. Larissa Halilovic is the uh, head of the project for digital uh, cities and director of the British Council in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We'll talk about the initiatives, how to push cities toward the digital transformation across the region. This is not a national project, it's typically a regional Western Balkan project. And how the initiatives on the national and government level are helping and supporting the transformation towards digital cities. How those digital key enablers, when we say signature, electronic signature or EID or interoperability, whether those uh, key enablers assist and empower the transformation within the cities to become digital cities or not. Please, Larissa, can you tell us a little bit more about the project and what's happening? Across the Thank region. you very much, and it's really a huge pleasure to be here. Um, you mentioned I am the director of British Council Bosnia and Herzegovina, but today I have several heads um, representing Western Balkans and also representing an initiative by the UK government uh, in preparation for the Western Balkan Summit in London um, in July. Now, um, we've heard quite a lot about what governments are doing in order to set up and to enable the transformation. But what we found really interesting was to look at what happens when you connect cities. 
because as you know, um, the population is by and large living more and more in the cities. Cities have their own way of operating. And we decided to look at a pilot project over a very intensive period of time, over four months, to, to see what happens when you connect cities of Western Balkans and the UK, uh, looking at the policy of city administrations, but also, more importantly, looking at what happens when you connect the digital industry of the Western Balkans and the UK. Um, and through this, we explored, as I mentioned, policy, we explored skills, and we also explored collaboration and mobility. And what we found was really, really interesting, and I have to emphasize the time frame of what we were doing was really quite brief. So it, one of the critical success factors was to look at the interest and readiness. And I personally, when I was drawing the circles of trying to plan what the connections might look like, I was thinking maybe we'll be able to connect 12 cities in the UK and 12 cities in Western Balkans, maybe some 24 businesses. It actually turned out that the interest in connecting people is so large um, that we had 129 businesses only in Western Balkans wanting to participate. And this has really told us quite a lot about the importance of connecting people, but connecting them in a way that makes sense to them, and also making sure that they have business-to-business -business connections, meetings, partnerships, and a platform through which they can collaborate. What was also very, very interesting to find out is, and we found this out very early on, that the UK and Western Balkans, when it comes to city, digital policy and strategy, are at very different points, as you might imagine. Um, we have also learned that amongst um, the 22 cities of Western Balkans that took part in the pilot project, unfortunately, we do not yet have any digital policy and strategy in place. However, the actual readiness and the willingness and the commitment of city administrations, of mayors, of people who are working in this area is absolutely there. Um, and it was interesting to see in one of the boot camps which we uh, conducted that maybe there is a competitive advantage when you are lagging behind a bit. Now, Vasco, you said at the beginning of the session, you were asking how can we catch up. Um, one of our uh, experts on the project really posed quite an interesting uh, question saying, well, maybe it's better to sort of come on board when others have already invested in the learning and development in an area. Because there is a lot to be learned from the countries uh, like the UK and the European Union in general um, about the policy and strategy. But the point is that the Western Balkans countries have recognized and the cities in the Western Balkans have recognized that they need to work together and they need to collaborate, but collaborate in practice in order to move the digital strategy forward. Um, and I'm really excited to see that there was actually an initiative by the mayor of Sarajevo to hold an additional meeting in addition to those uh, held in Budva and London and Birmingham. Uh, he organized one in Sarajevo where people from Macedonia drove for 14 hours in the snow um, to actually discuss what's important to them. And this includes defining the digital industry, mapping what exists in the digital industry area. Yesterday we heard uh, in the digital skills session how important it is to actually include um, the research community, education uh, institutions into this process. This has also been recognized by the city administrations. Um, and finally, the digital services for the citizens. But very often we have found that the solutions, such as Moj Vozduk that you were mentioning that we saw brilliantly presented last night, um, they come from young people, from startups who have amazing ideas. And this is exactly the second part of our learning point, uh, was when we took young people who are involved in startups, in hubs, in co-working spaces, when we brought them together in Western Balkans and when we took them over to the UK, what we found very, very obvious uh, was A, they needed to connect and collaborate. Although this may sound banal, um, in reality, 
they need help in facilitating these connections, and also they need um, a safe space to discuss what's important to them. Not us bringing our ideas on what's important, but real business challenges that they're facing. What I also found totally fascinating was when we took a group of young people from Western Balkans to see some of the best practice in the UK, in Bristol, in Manchester, um, the business representatives in the UK were hugely impressed by the talent and by the skill and by the overall innovation and ability of these young people from Western Balkans. We even had a situation where um, a young woman, founder of a virtual reality uh, company from Mostar in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, was just completing her business-to-business -business meeting. And basically, she said to us when we asked her how did it go, she said, well, they just asked me how long would it take for your whole team to move to Manchester and start working with us. But what I was really, really happy to hear was that her response was, we have had offers from many countries to move, to leave Western Balkans, to leave Bosnia and Herzegovina and to go and work there and create a better life. But we don't want to do that. We want to stay in Western Balkans and if you want to work with us from there, because we can generate value, then please do come and see us. We can be in contact. We can do business together. But this is exactly the example of what we were talking about yesterday in the digital skills. You want to keep the young people and give them the space and give them the tools and give them the connection capacities to actually move around and to do business together amongst themselves and also with the UK and with all the countries um, around the world who really have the need for the talent but also the value that's created here. And the final point I'd like to say, collaboration is the key absolutely in all segments. Now we had something like a challenge for these participating businesses to um, come up with a collaboration proposal. In less than a month, they managed to implement seven totally different collaboration projects, including something really special coming from Macedonia, looking at the musical industry and how you can monetize the musical industry in partnership with the UK partner. We also had um, a really interesting FinTech example from Kosovo, partnering uh, with London to see how you can, again, track the services for citizens, which are so relevant for all of us who are there standing in queue, you know, waiting for the stamp or waiting to find out where our request has, has come to. But also, what we have found is the share opportunity for working together and for mobility is of essence. Now, you probably know how difficult it is to get a visa for the UK for people from Western Balkans and how long it takes. Um, so, and also between Kosovo and Bosnia and Herzegovina, again, it's hugely important that we put in place practices that make it easier for people to come together, to move around, and to do in the business what they're able to do. Now, what also fascinated me totally was that originally we were looking at a pilot involving some 60 people. We had 226 people who were actively, enjoy, actively actually engaged in developing their skills, developing their network, and working together. And I'm not talking about clicks on Facebook or Instagram or any other social media. I'm talking about actually people learning together, exchanging, and doing business together, which is hugely important. And one third of those people were women. And these are women in the digital industry, uh, some of whom are here today, wonderful to see. And I think this is a really important learning point to see how needed it is to connect the cities at policy level, how needed it is to connect Western Balkans with itself, across itself, with other countries, and how important it is to develop the skills and abilities of people involved in the digital industry in order to actually come on the global market as significant players. So this is in brief what we've done over the past four months. I can see the energy involved in the explanation of what you do in your activities. I think it will take another panel to get the details of what you are able to, to share with us. Thank you for the energy. I think that the audience would definitely would like to get in touch with you after the session to get an information furthermore how they can engage maybe potentially in those regional activities with you. Uh, you have tackled a lot of uh, regional 
challenges in cooperating across the region, how to work cross-border and how to communicate or connect cross-border. We see that on a daily basis, basically. Doing business in the region, it's quite difficult even to send an invoice. As simple as that. Not to say an electronic invoice, that's impossible still in a lot of countries in the region. But then the structure of the invoice, what you're invoicing, taxes, withholding taxes, six countries, six different rules of law. And then this is quite difficult for a small startup. If you're an established enterprise, you already have the infrastructure, you have your finance department, legal department, people taking care of those, all those things to bridge the barriers. But if you're a small company, we're talking about startup camp and tech parks in, over there, and to make a company of two work across the region, I would say it's almost impossible. They will be buried with, legislation, with legislative procedures or administrative procedures to, let's say, make it able, able into the region. So today it's one of those digital transformations is how to tear down those barriers, how to build easier and streamlined processes for the businesses to work across the region and reach a bigger market. I think a lot about this can, share, can be shared by uh, Mr. Mislav Galler. He's coming as a CEO of OneWeb Macedonia, but he is coming from the region. He's a Croatian working in Skopje. He has different perspective from the Croatian market, Macedonian market, but being part of a, a regional player or European player as a telecom operator, I'm certain you have different views of what's happening across the region, what the differences in the pace dynamism or the uh, administration barriers across the region to be dynamic as it should be as a telecom industry. Welcome and please share your, your thoughts with the panel. It's also a proof that uh, we are part of this uh, agenda as a, as a telco provider, as a connectivity provider, and uh, practically investor in infrastructure, which is a starting point or baseline for all the initiatives. It's great to hear from the, all the participants in the panel. We have European, Western European best practices. We have already in the region. Uh, developed great. I was really, really super surprised uh, seeing these uh, initiatives. Uh, also hearing Minister saying uh, uh, that we need to invest further and uh, that we are onboarding. Also great connectivities uh, and great initiatives and best practices connecting uh, uh, the citizens, connecting uh, uh, practically uh, or let's say overpassing the differences in the regions but also across the Europe and globally. So this is, a, this is a great thing. So in the, in the last, uh, let's say, a few years, this digital transformation is happening and mainly we are listening about the initiatives and what could be done and what we should have done. Uh, in the meantime, uh, just to, to, to share uh, some experiences from telco perspective, we are investing. We are investing in infrastructure because, um, okay, this is our core business and practically it is, it is important that we constantly, constantly changing and adapting to the new trends and uh, customer needs. So basically there is more and more data demand. Uh, so basically uh, if you would, if you would uh, take uh, one data which is really interesting, millennial customers, uh, more than 50% of millennial customers practically run their lives from the uh, mobile devices. So basically we have to adapt as a, as a, as a telcos. What does it mean? Uh, especially if, uh, if I refer to the one WIP, uh, we are investing in the last three years more than 80 million euros, so basically in infrastructure, that means that more than 90% of every earned euro then are, we are reinvesting in the network because this is the uh, essence of our business. But uh, what is good and what is great and uh, an opportunity for us that we can uh, uh, not only uh, provide to our customers uh, all the uh, prerequisites to run the services, but also we can onboard with the governments, with the agencies, with the, with the, with the public sector to, to, to run the, the digital agenda. But n not to repeat myself or to repeat uh, what was already said uh, through all the panels uh, in these two days, uh, infrastructure is of course important and uh, with the telcos it's not only all about the uh, infrastructure. So we uh, as, a, as a company, we, have, uh, we are part of, as you already mentioned, this is, uh, we are part of even global company, IMX. So basically, uh, becoming a part of a global company uh, already four years ago, 
and uh, becoming a part of a cluster, that's also a, a good, uh, let's say, experience and know-how that we can share how is to be able to act and work on one platform, mainly to simplify the processes, to, to, to let's say, decrease the handling times, to, to provide a better service, to be uh, more agile. So basically, we are also changing the methods of our work within the company. We are changing also, we are not we are trying to adapt to the, to the, to the uh, newcomers, to millennials who are not having the, the, the same working, traditional working habits. They, are, they want more dynamic environment, they want to have uh, more, uh, let's say, freedom to express themselves and to, to show and share our, their ideas. So we are trying to be organized uh, more uh, agile and try to, 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 to let's say, um, uh, be more project-based oriented in our work. That means that we are also uh, de developing uh, the new platforms which uh, are providing us this, this ability. And not only that we are providing this internally, practically we are uh, uh, offering this uh, to the market. And basically what is the, 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 let's say, our idea is that we make our customers competitive on the global mar market. So it is important that not only providing them connectivity, it's also providing them the solutions to be free to practically communicate with the world, not only the region, and uh, practically to be competitive on the, on the global market. And uh, third, what is uh, quite important, uh, and also it is, it is uh, practically uh, addition, addition on, the, on the new way of work, what we are trying to apply in our premises, is uh, practically that we are investing heavily in the, in the knowledge. Uh, so we are technical uh, industry, we are uh, practically mostly, uh, sometimes even over-engineered, I would say. <laughs> no offense to all engineers in the, in, the, in the audience. So what we are trying to do now, practically we are, we are discovering new uh, models and new uh, skills which we are providing to, to our employees to be able to also to run the, the, the digital agenda and uh, to share this know-how. Because if in your own yard and if you are trying to provide a service, you are not aware what we could do, and how to, to, to execute, uh, practically it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not possible that you can then uh, be excellent in providing your service. And finally, this we cannot do alone. Not only by, by uh, making, uh, uh, let's say, cooperation and collaboration with the, with the public sector, we are trying to, to build uh, new partnerships with the companies, uh, also startups, uh, IT companies that have some know-how that practically for us it would, it would take too much time to develop, so practically we are trying to cooperate and on board in this, in, and let's say be part of this ecosystem which uh, puts us on the next level also as, a, as a telco providers. We also need some new revenue streams because investing more than 90% in infrastructure, it's a quite heavy investment. <laughs> Just want to support that. Good to hear. Uh, Good to hear that you are transforming first inside and then reaching the region, reaching the market, because then you are truly becoming a digital by, by design as a company. You can truly offer those services to the market because you will, and you will feel the transformation inside the company and work that. Also, uh, for us telcos and service providers, for us software providers, as I may say, it's quite interesting to partner with telecom providers. First of all, you're usually a regional or a global player. So working with the telecom providers is an easier access to the region because you are already positioned in different countries working with one of your local national operators. It's usually an easier access to other national operators and then providing services to m more than one region, it's easier to work with telecom providers. Of course, you're seeking for, uh, you're seeking for partnerships. It's also an open door for small software providers across the region to work with the telcos and service providers to reach the region easier and bridge the, the problems and barriers that are usually very difficult if you try to bridge them alone. Uh, we'll talk more about those cooperations and other topics of interest. Uh, we would like to hear a view of a software vendor, of a software provider working in the region, but also being a global, one of the top global software providers in the world. SAP, it's present in, uh, it's present in the region for many years. Uh, Dusan Radošević is leading the regional uh, team 
related for the S&P in the Western Balkans, a wider region than Western Balkans, basically it's an Adriatic region, South I can East say, <laughs> Southeast Europe uh, region. <laughs> and you have the experience working across the countries. You see the diff different levels of development of the uh, digital markets up in the national level, but also you, maybe you can share your view of how do you see the current state of the digital single markets at mm -hmm. the moment? What's your view and what's your experience working yeah. with the... Thank you. Thank you for, for introduction. Yes, uh, I, because my predecessors uh, uh, have said a lot about uh, digitalization, I would actually try to point from the angle of SAP. Uh, and by the way, SAP is the <coughs> biggest uh, business, business software provider in the world, and roughly more than 70% of uh, GDP of the whole world is coming from the companies who is actually using SAP software, just for those who do, does not know how it looks like. So we strongly believe in digitalization. Uh, proof for that is also that together with Deutsche Telekom we financed the study which was presented yesterday, which means that we really uh, want to, to, to work on that and we see not the opportunity, this is must, because digitalization is already there, who thinks or who is uh, trying to start now working on that, he is already late, so it came earlier and maybe two terms I would like to stress, there is a digitization and digitalization. So digitization started earlier, maybe 30 years ago, uh, actually, uh, uh, how to say, transferring, uh, transferring analog artifacts to the digital one. It is ongoing, ne never ended probably, but the digitalization means in, in terms of SAP something new, uh, new models, new business processes which could be discovered and actually uh, 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 provide uh, uh, new chances for the society to use it. And uh, my colleagues uh, before said, we are also thinking about millennials, they are working differently. Uh, we think that uh, within 10 years they will rule the world in the business and the government and we have to adjust. So this is not a question of goodwill, this is must, who don't follow that uh, would be disappear actually, also from the business, etc. So actually we are thinking about uh, business for us, the government is very important part, like 40% of industries we are covering, 25 is uh, public sector, so most important, I would say that way. And uh, what we think uh, digitalization would bring actually, uh, how to say, real-time uh, uh, business or the government, whatever. So uh, if millennials are adjusted to use uh, for everything smartphones, etc., and they want the responses immediately. So actually we have to provide, I would say from the software point of view, speed, volume and security. And all of those aspects, there are also the others, are extremely important. Because if you don't have a speed to, 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 to keep attention uh, of, of the millennials more than two seconds, he would uh, switch somewhere else. So you have to have a speed. Then you have to have a volume, because we are now producing uh, more data than ever before. So actually, whole, uh, let's say, uh, um, uh, number of data in the world are doubling uh, roughly every 18 months, like more, more slower in, in hardware before, etc. So we have to be ready to actually accept such a big uh, volumes of data. On the other hand, security, nothing. Without security, there is no business, there is no uh, government, there is nothing. If you don't trust each other, you can't communicate, so everything else is worthless. So we have really to provide softwares, or, but the regulations are more important because software comes later, which are actually able to cover security in a proper way. This is, in my opinion, I am a mathematician, uh, asymptotical process. It would never end, but it, I am very happy that we are doing on that. The SAP is trying to follow the governments and actually other bodies uh, like uh, GDPR Act, etc., in order to provide the software which could be a good tool to uh, use those standards, etc., etc. So roughly this is actually what is needed from our point of view. So what we have done, we actually made a completely new uh, generation of the software which is, which is completely in memory which means that it's much faster. This is not using uh, hardware disks, etc. and we are working on that. We have the brand name, this is called uh, uh, HANA, or S for HANA, which could comprehend with the speed, volume, and security, a large volumes of data, and then we could handle that in a way which we, which we could. Also, we provide the tools uh, like uh, uh, for data science. So this, these big amounts of data could be analyzed and very helpfully used for different purposes. Such those purposes could be very good or very bad, as we know in the recent last weeks, etc. So we have to be careful uh, that this usage would be okay, but we are not able 
to guarantee that. We are able to provide the tools that somebody else have to use it, like driving car. You, you could drive car badly or well, if, even if you use a Ferrari, could be a bad drive. So somehow the governments have to do that, the business have to do that, and this is what we are actually doing. And maybe one thing for us, we think that uh, actually digitalization in terms of making business, new business model is mostly innovation. So SAP is providing, how to say, standard software to comprehend what, what they have said, but actually innovation would provide may, maybe most. New uh, working uh, places, uh, new models on, on living, etc., etc., and we are able to do that, including new stuff. We had uh, uh, somebody from SAP was yesterday also on a panel uh, 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 now about uh, blockchain stuff, about uh, machine learning, about artificial, artificial intelligence, and we have already tools in a cloud or a premise, doesn't matter, which could actually provide usage of that, and we are really uh, happy uh, to be here and actually to communicate and cooperate with everybody. A last thing, maybe, because we are a global company, we could provide uh, actually uh, best practice from all over the world, but I would say digitalization is uh, so fresh that innovation is better, even most important than actually even best practice. So this is from my point of view. We'll talk about later about the digital economy and the data science and big data. I think that you have uh, very good inputs around this, and, but later on we'll come back to this subject because I'm certain that it's of quite of interest of a lot of startups and software companies in the region because they see a huge opportunity around this area of work. Uh, we have heard all the panelists in different areas and focus, and uh, I'm pleased to see diverse experiences all over the region. and initiatives, basically, that all of them are running separately. But <coughs> what I can see is that we are all facing some challenges. We all face some obstacles in being cross-border in cooperation. Even public sector, if they do cooperate cross-borders, it's very traditional. The question is, well, can we move this to become digital by default? Whether administrations even cross-border can become uh, digital as in communication. Whether we can see in the next couple of years those transformation leading by example where administrations would say, okay, we trust the Albanian or the Serbian administration in their digital form, not in a traditional paper form. And by leading by example, maybe push the traditional industries to go forward and to uh, leapfrog, let's say, to transform and use those digital services. I've been reading, uh, preparing for the session, I've been reading a lot of European experiences around this uh, cooperation across regions because he, although we are talking about digital single market, we can also say that there is a, a huge way to go to really connect the whole market in Europe and to enable cross countries and cross uh, even city and municipal cooperation in Europe. Uh, I've read some couple of uh, successful examples where using the trust services and the implementation of the recommended uh, key enablers and building blocks, uh, some of the countries in, the, in Europe have successfully implemented uh, using of public services cross borders or across municipalities or across region. Can you maybe, David, share some experience that you know or uh, have reading about some Dutch experiences, some Austrian experiences? Maybe you have some of those at your hand that you can maybe, uh, not as a specific example, but as a movement forward how to enable the single market. Yeah. Well, I think that you're right. There's lots, there's lots of examples out there. Um, but I think one of the important points that Minister Manchewski made is that the public sector, digitizing the public sector is an important driver here. And I think one very good example uh, at the moment, the Bulgarian presidency is pushing through a lot of the measures under the digital single market. The previous presidency, Estonia, I think uh, uh, one of the interesting aspects of the digital process in Estonia is that the process of EID was not driven by the private sector, it was driven by the public sector, who realized that they had to offer better services to their citizens, they had to be able to, to, to uh, uh, they had an opportunity to do this, and they adopted electronic identity, and then all the banks realized, actually, this is really useful, we should do this, we need to connect, and so on. So I think, for me, one of the extremely interesting example, uh, takeaways from this conference is that, the, uh, is that the public sector can play a really active role, that the public sector does not lead to lag behind the private sector. There's a lot of examples, you mentioned the Dutch example, 
I think cities are extremely important, and the, uh, there's a lot of work goes on in Brussels, for example, in the Committee of the Regions, trying to link regions and cities together, uh, where mayors are finding that the mayors can deliver fairly rapidly a lot of the services that you have to deliver at city level electronically and that uh, um, working together they can learn a lot more and I think this is exactly what we're trying to do today and I can see the speed with which all of the information is going moving from one person to another and I think joining up like this is is exactly uh, one of the ways to go and as I said the the uh, e-government conference under the Austrian presidency next year I think will be one uh, place where um, the, uh, the economies of the region can, can uh, learn a lot from everybody else and that the uh, e-government declaration from Tallinn last year uh, doesn't have to remain a declaration but can also be the beginning of a process of exchange of experience and so on. Uh, we heard about cities and the initiatives of region in the EU but we know and we are aware that the regional economies and government, regional governments are struggling with the finance and the budget to finance the digital transformation. I can imagine that cities have even bigger challenge in this area because to transform a city, the level of investment is not much smaller than the level of investment of a national level. If we are talking about small cities, this is even uh, harder because the budgets available are so small. The question is how we can support the municipalities and small cities into digital transformation by using the support of the national level enabling key enablers on the national level like EID or digital signature interoperability or many others are building blocks that can really simplify or even make it more efficient and more affordable for the municipalities to transform and to deliver their services electronically for the citizens and businesses. Do you think around this? Do you have any initiatives in the digital cities and initiatives that you lead to talk and to maybe enable the municipalities to look for enablers on the national level to help them transform easier? Um, quite useful was to see that um, the level of the government is interested uh, at state level to actually collaborate with the city because it wouldn't really make sense to have separate and disjointed strategies and action plans. Um, however, we have come across cases where um, the state level is not really that connected to what's going on in the city level. Um, what we have found definitely as one of the key points in moving forward, because like you say, cities themselves don't have, uh, let's say, sufficient investment into the infrastructure, but they are able to be the connecting force between higher levels of the government and also, as I mentioned, um, in the UK we really saw some effective and useful ways of public-private partnerships, which we touched on this, uh, this morning as well, um, and sometimes it really... Uh, only requires the initial investment at the city level uh, to ensure that you provide space. For example, the Sharp factory um, in Manchester is a really good example where the city council invested uh, some funds into providing the space, making it uh, usable by the community, but then it has grown into a public-private partnership which now generates 3,000 jobs in the digital industry per year. Now, uh, you probably know the digital industry in the UK is growing twice as fast as any other. And this is a really good in incentive for a city to invest because this money is coming back. Um, and the costs are being covered, but also you are generating jobs, you are keeping people there. So again, our learning point is let's help the cities come up with their digital strategy and policy and let's join forces into everyone who's already investing. I mean, all of your companies are actually working on the infrastructure. We heard so much is going on internationally across the region on the infrastructure, but the cities need help in making it practically actually useful to the citizens. There is a huge challenge across countries. A lot of investments to be done. I'm certain that national agencies and national offices and ministries, they're all calculating what is ahead. They see that the budget available, even the support available from the international community, it's still not enough for the speed that we need to accelerate, to catch up. Because it's not just to transform, but to transform on time. Because if we are lagging behind the European Union and the global economies, the leading economies in the world, we're going to lose the game. Because then we are not competitive. In 10 years from now, 
will be so much back if we are investing on the same pace that it will be too late for us then to transform. How we can engage the private sector to accelerate the transformation? Have maybe the national agencies, ministries consider service providers or telecom infrastructure or telecom providers, service providers and software providers to become part of the investment cycle in new innovative models to support this transformation on a faster pace. We are talking about EIDs. We are talking about electronic signature. There is a lot of uh, innovative models how we can engage the private sector to, to accelerate this, this process. Maybe, uh, Mikhail, can you give us maybe a view on this? Have you ever uh, considered maybe engaging the industry into this process to support? Svakako, čini mi se, ja bi moje izlaganje više fokusirao na neke praktične stvari, jer moramo biti pragmatični i moramo praviti brze rezultate. Svi osjećamo potrebu da se na nivou regiona što pre integrišemo, povežemo. Digitalizacija jeste prav primer za to. Ajde sebi da postavimo izazove, šta je to što već do sledećeg skupa u Beogradu možemo da zajednički postavimo i uradimo. Pričao sam, imamo novi zakon o elektronskom poslovanju, radimo na podzakonskim aktima koji će definisati elektronsku identifikaciju, koji će definisati različite šeme autentikacije korisnika i korišćenja potpisa u kladu u skladu sa EIDAS preporukama, ali ne pričamo o tome kako iz jedne zemlje možemo usluge elektronske uprave da koristimo u drugim zemljama. Svi smo svesni, ja sam kada pričam na materijnjem jeziku, da najveći deo vas i razume i nema ni potrebu da stavi slušalice s prevodom. Ja lično imam suprugu koja dolazi iz Makedonije, imam rodbinu u Makedoniji, imam potrebu da moja porodica komunicira sa uslugama elektronske uprave prekogranično. Ajmo da postavimo cilj, ajmo da budemo pragmatični kako možemo da obezbedimo da naše elektronske identifikacije, naši elektronski sertifikati i elektronska uprava zaživi na nivou regiona. Ajmo da postavimo cilj da prve rezultate već imamo naredne godine na samitu u Beogradu. Neko bude jedan challenge i jedan izazov za sve nas i poziv da sa praktičnim primjerima pokažemo kako digitalizacija doprinosi napretku celog regiona. Imam i drugi predlog. Kada razmišljamo o infrastrukturi, ulazimo, bar mi u Srbiji, u implementaciju jednog velikog data centra. Gradimo ga od početka na Livadi. Velika investicija je da želimo da imamo delove za elektronsku upravu, delove za telekomunikacijone operatore i to je možda odgovor na vaše pitanje. Da, mi ne bežimo od toga da telekom kao veliki nacionalni provajder bude naš partner u realizaciji infrastrukture data centara, ali pravimo i četvrti segment koji može biti namenjen tržištu, ali može biti namenjeni i saradnji na nivou regiona. Evo izazov za kolegu ministra iz Makedonije. Da li imamo snagu da naše disaster recovery bude u Makedoniji, a vaš disaster recovery da bude u Srbiji? Da li imamo tu svest i tu zakonsku moć da verujemo jedni drugima, pa da naši podaci budu na teritoriji druge zemlje? Ako Estonija može svoj dizaster da stavi negde u Luksemburg i da veruje nekim drugim dalekim zemljama sa kojima i ne može da priča bez slušalica, da li mi imamo snagu da ovakvim konkretnim primjerima preko granične saradnje uspostavimo najbolji dialog na nivou regiona. Evo neću da dužim, ovim pravim jedan challenge i izazov za sve nas i Želim da pokažemo prave rezultate za godine dana. Ja gledam reakcije industrije na panelu i u publici dok si pričao. Svi su se krenuli smijati. 
<laughs> Mislim, osmeh pozitivan, ne, ne u negativnom smislu. Pozitivnom smislu da to je stvarno veliki challenge. Uh, it's a big challenge, I will switch to English, sorry to respond in Serbian. It's, <laughs> it becomes natural when we communicate together. So uh, there was a smile, a positive smile in the audience, on the panel and in the audience, while you are talking about these huge initiatives and steps forward. We see them almost impossible at the moment, but if we start thinking around that and going through the regional uh, European examples, we can see that happening in the near future. The question is what we can do about it and how we can move forward into those big steps forward. You're talking about disaster recovery, but you're, you have mentioned also EID. Uh, Mirlinda was talking about, uh, let's do the interoperability regional project. As I can see, different countries have different uh, activities to propose and to lead. If we see the region and each of the countries becoming the leader in one of those initiatives, and establishing a trust on one initiative and then transiting this trust on another initiative, this will definitely uh, move the, the region being more integrated as a digital single market in the future. So let's engage on this. Let's uh, continue to talk and move forward. I would really like to be on the panel next year in Serbia and applauding on the examples that we have established some kind of a trust. I see this obstacle and barrier on a daily basis. I will give you a practical example. Macedonia has an e-procurement system for more than five, six years already. All the proposals or the tenders are done electronically. Even regional providers and European and global providers can participate and submit their, their proposals uh, in electronic form. But there is a huge barrier. The way they need to do and the way the public authorities verify the authenticity of the electronic signature how do they authenticate? The problem is that when they see the tender proposal being opened, by the time that they overcome the barrier to get the identity, to authenticate, to verify the electronic signature being valid and recognized locally in Macedonia, the tender is closed. It's too late. So if they want to engage on tenders in Macedonia, they need to prepare ahead and then follow the tenders. So this is a barrier, a real barrier. Establishing an electronic identity trust an electronic signature trust will, this, will tear down this barrier, meaning that Serbian, Albanian, Croatian, regional companies can easily participate in e-procurement locally here and by just using their identity they use on the portals in Albania or on the portals in Serbia. So this is a huge goal and step forward and I applaud on the initiative and let's make it a conclusion from the panel. Let's move forward with a couple of initiatives, connect the region, interoperability. Well, we can also add the open data initiatives. I heard that Serbia is going to have very soon uh, their own portal, the same for Macedonia. Albania with this, uh, within this year is going to have its own open data portal. Also, the exchange of open data, I think, can be a very good uh, regional initiative, as well as interoperability and EID trust. It's going to be a very promising year for the industry. All those initiatives running in parallel would be, would be hard to follow, but still, it's a challenge to, to, for the industry, and we're embracing the, such big initiatives. Uh, how can... Uh, how can we use the investment power, how we can use the infrastructure power of telcos as a service providers to, to grasp this opportunity? How we can partner with the telcos, public sector and the software industry to reach those opportunities and to make it a reality? Also for all the participants, you're really welcome to contact us and share your ideas with us. So it's practically easy. Also. For the government, it's easy. We have to just have an uh, investment-friendly environment, and we will continue to invest. And uh, yeah, we are we are although we, we, we are looking at you already mentioned that we are global, usually global companies or let's say big European regional companies, but we are not so rigid anymore. So we are open to the to the ideas and to the <laughs> partners to to develop further. Um, maybe uh, it is it is really interesting thing to share with all of you. Uh, how we are also improving ourselves from the inside. We are now, now uh, uh, let's say, testing some uh, robotics within our customer services. So it doesn't mean that uh, you are speaking with uh, human bots like Sophia. Um, <laughs> I don't know. You saw on the on YouTube Will Smith dating Sophia. So it's basically it's not like that. Uh, We're not going to uh, call 
we're not going to call one web customer service today, yeah, yeah, yeah. but we are aiming <laughs> to this direction, but uh, uh, we cannot develop it by, by ourselves. It is developed by our partners, and uh, we are trying to, 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 to develop something together in, in some sense. So basically, it's, it's not that hard. We need to improve ourselves. We need to improve our infrastructure, of course, but for that, uh, we need to have, as I said, uh, really good cooperation and open mind, and let's say, not only initiatives, but also the, the, the practical practical acts and, and uh, practically start to, to develop. Right? So it's not that hard. I see the commitment of Albania into developing a huge number of electronic services. You mentioned 500 electronic services. This is an amazing number. I can say that this is maybe the largest number of electronic services I've seen across the region. Can you maybe commit yourself to envision an electronic service that is a cross-border service, maybe in the near future? This would lead the interoperability connection and all the trust services being enabled before you can enable a cross-border electronic service. Oh, well, uh, your residency, uh, the project that we're working on, probably can be expanded in e res uh, residency in other regions, so not just the business that can uh, create uh, a business in Albania and have uh, the digital seal and digital uh, electronic signature recognized, but all the region which can uh, create business in every country that it would like to uh, to have and then have those e-procurement and e-cross-border uh, recognitions very easily uh, managed, I, I suggest. Also, our platform is, uh, is very open, and if we decide to go through a cross-border interoperability uh, project, I think the uh, e-services that uh, our regional uh, countries can profit from each other will be like really um, considered and increased, like every country will think of what makes the life of its citizen and businesses easy and what it needs from the other, the other country. So talking about interoperability, about standard of data exchanging and the legal framework to make that possible I think will be the first step to to have our regional e-services integrated. Damian, how far do you see this discussion? Can you imagine talking with the regional leaders and finding the common understanding that we can move forward in these initiatives? Do you see them real? Do you see them that we can align them locally and both regionally at the same time? Well, as I said, now it's actually easy. We don't need to make them. They are aware. The awareness is here, the support is here. Uh, all it takes to release the will. And now we have the will. We did not have the will previously in the region, unfortunately, for many things. We had different kinds of wills, I guess. But now we have the commitment, we have the will. And now it's much easier even to find finances jointly, even than to engage from national budgets, even than to engage into these kind of ideas that ju we just heard. Uh, I'm more than certain that in Belgrade next year, Mr. Ivanovich's wife will have her Macedonian EID. I'm certain about this. And why not to trust uh, for this disaster and recovery centers? I mean, if we trust each other for our dig digital stamps and signatures, why not? It's a perfectly good idea. It makes sense. We were, again, famous for many disasters and recoveries in the past, <laughs> different kind of disasters and recoveries. Now let's do this. That's, that's a different thing. Uh, but we, we have finally the support not only of the local uh, authorities, we have the support of the European Commission, which is also very important, and of the international donors. And I'm, I really have to say I'm, I'm overwhelmed by the presence of relevant people during this summit. We were not sure who, who is going to come. And, of course, we were sure about the authorities and the governments, and they're here. But the businesses, the, the international organizations, the CSOs, uh, citizens last night, everybody's here. We had discussions with the EBRD, with different financial institutions. All of them are seeking for opportunities how to support us into this process. And again, coming back to the basic point, only it takes a will. The digitalization, as you said, I call it just translation. What is digitalization? It's, 
translation into computer language of a process that we already need to deliver. I'm just making it digital. So it takes a will. And then we'll find the translators to do it for us. And then, yes, we need definite support of the business sector because, unfortunately, the administrations do not have the capacities by itself. So, it, again, it's a joint effort, effort by everyone that's in this room in the last several days. Great to hear this passion and commitment for the future to come. Larissa will take a, a homework out of the summit to envision a project which will include cities of the region to transform by the next year. This is another challenge in one year time. So the clock is ticking. 12 months from now, we want to hear some good news in Belgrade in the Digital Cities Initiative. But also, uh, we need to talk about, you mentioned open data, uh, Merlinda, and regional cooperation in open data. Do you find any challenges in uh, big data, data science with the data across the region? Are the governments and the enterprises still protective of their data, even if they're not, if not some personal data? Yeah, I, I would maybe understand the question like uh, cloud or not to cloud. Yeah, <laughs> this is not a question one anymore. One <laughs> but even if it's not cloud, are the enterprises or the governments ready to share non-personal data for data science purposes? Yeah, yeah. Or? Um, what, what I want to mention, actually, that the answer about the G cloud is more difficult. This is like G cloud or not G cloud is a challenge. Long term, this is also not a question. But I would say now the hybrid. Why I'm mentioning cloud? Because uh, enormous uh, uh, number of data uh, which you have, it is actually even not possible, even not safe to put it in, in your special, I would say, harder. So actually you have to actually turn to the cloud and to the, let's say, global networks actually. Maybe not one cloud, maybe some, some networks or cloud, etc. So from that point of view, big data should be in a cloud. This is obvious. Question is the legislation, etc. So Mikhailo mentioned that this challenge, I think this is a very important thing, that we see how we could adjust. Maybe one way is that we adjust legislation to the European Union, and I think that we are all heading there, so probably this problem would disappear if we are, became the members. So hopefully it would also happen. So this is, this is actually very important. From the, from the point of view uh, of, I would say, infrastructure and infrastructure has actually uh, how, how to say it, uh, telco stuff uh, there is then software which you have to, to, to use and the, at the end potential innovation new business model this is also I would, I would say uh, looks that is, it is mostly solved and actually questions which cloud are offered for that stuff for, for the big data for whatever cross-border stuff etc etc but uh, but uh, what you really really have to actually somehow uh, uh, handle is that um, uh, if you want to have islands which probably most government government has of the or silosis and you want to connect it and you make infrastructure for that it would be really time-consuming stuff, uh, standardization probably never ended successfully. If you put things in the cloud, or I would say currently hybrid, and put something, like I think it is done in Serbia, in the cloud, what was possible in the moment, and decrease the percentage of the stuff in the cloud, integration would come more naturally, and this is probably the only way how we will go to that. And then actually with this, uh, let's say, source of data in a cloud, as big data, we could really do data science on top but taking care about GDPR. <laughs> this Thank is you. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, good, good perspective on uh, the cloud transformation and the data science ahead of us. It's good to hear that there's the energy for the preparation for the Olympics coming in in a couple of years, joining the digital single market in Europe. We see this as a preparatory work across the countries in the region, so we are ready to join the European family of the integrated digital single market. Hope that we're going to have a lot of things to be proud of next year in Belgrade to acknowledge one year of development next year. I would like to address the audience. Uh, I hope that you have enjoyed the discussion during this panel and maybe we have touched point of some of your interest. Maybe we have missed something and if you have a question to target to the panelists, to the audience, uh, to the uh, speakers at the panel, feel free to, to raise your hand and address. Yes. If we don't have a question from the audience, then we're going to conclude this session. Yes, we have one. Yes. Yes, please. Uh, here, microphone is coming. 
Sorry, I couldn't see you from the camera. <laughs> Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, I have one question because you touched uh, briefly on GDPR. A little bit close to the mic because... Uh, you touched briefly on GDPR. So basically I have a question with regards to that. Currently, all of the countries in the Western Balkans are treated as third-party external countries with regards to the European Union. So basically if you want to work with uh, companies in the EU, which deal with personal data and health data and everything related, we are going to be treated as uh, exporting data outside of the EU. So can something be done to target that? Because there are countries outside of the EU which Both are still regarded as countries which are not third party. So I think it's very important for companies here which are dealing with EU countries to be able to benefit from that and to somehow uh, consolidate the legal frameworks so we are have blanket protection by the GDPR so that we can continue working with uh, companies within the EU, which is a very important market for uh, companies that deal with ICT in Macedonia, uh, with, uh, with regards to companies in the EU. I if you can briefly touch on that subject and if you can start uh, preparations on dealing with that regulatory framework, it will be a lot of help. Can you repeat? Uh to whom the question was addressed, I was not able to I hear. think uh, to Minister Manchevsky and to all of the others, because I think it will target everybody else, because everybody who is dealing with uh, companies in the EU will now have a problem. <coughs> okay. I hope that the, the quality of the voice was a little bit low, so I hope... This is why I yes, uh, use technology. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> now I heard the question. Um, very good and very relevant question. Uh, actual. Um, we have touched this issue with um, Commissioner Gabriel during my last visit to Sofia. So I cannot say that we have any concrete announcements, but there is a will to discuss about this. And just getting back as an example, only in July last year when I first, when I, not I, but we together first mentioned the idea of um, reduction of roaming fees towards European Union, uh, people were laughing at us. <laughs> so they, were, they thought that this was not going to be possible. We even did not have that much of a support, I think, even in, in the Commission. But I think when they saw our joint determines that, that we want to push this, now it's becoming realistic. This is one of the issues and burning topics, I would say, coming into consideration the upcoming national regulations that are already in some kind of a procedure and what's happening on the European level, that we have to do something about this. So the alert is there, the awareness is there. We have initiated the discussions, but I can still not say that we have something concrete that we can show as a result. Uh, we will need the back, the push from the businesses from all countries as well to address this issue so that we jointly ask for this in front of our European partners. Thank you. I hope we have addressed the question. We need to conclude the panel because we have extended a little bit more than it was allowed with the planned schedule. But still, I think it was an interesting discussion. I hope that you have enjoyed it. Thank you to all the speakers in the panel. And I really enjoyed hosting the panel and hope to have this same audience soon in some of the regional events. Thank you and thank you all. Distinguished, distinguished guests, honorable participants, on behalf of the host countries, allow me to thank you for your participation on the first Digital Summit 2008. I hope that you enjoyed the discussions that you have chance to follow. To follow. Uh, it was a re real pleasure to host you in Skopje. Uh, I, it is without uh, any doubt that this was an excellent summit, and I'm looking forward to see the results that, the results that it brings. Uh, I hope that we'll see each other again on the session at 3 uh, p.m., the session about fake news. Uh, I hope that you will enjoy your stay in Skopje, and see you at 3.